Hello, my name is Victoria Lucas and I'm a PhD student at Newcastle University in the UK. My PhD research looks at early medieval glass recycling practices. Today I'm going to present a portion of this research using experimental archaeology to better understand the ways in which recycling affects the chemistry and workability of glass. The experiment was designed to answer three primary questions. How does chemical composition of glass change with repeated recycling? How does repeated recycling affect the workability of glass? And how might these factors have affected the technological and decision-making practices of glass workers in antiquity? There are several ways in which we think recycling might alter the chemical composition of glass, either in terms of contamination or loss. First, the effects of gases and ashes from the burning of wood fuel. Wood fuel, we assume, is going to introduce potash, phosphates, magnesia and calcium into the glass. There could also be some degree of interaction with the walls of the crucible, a chemical reaction between the clay of the crucible and the glass batch itself. This could introduce magnesia, iron oxide and titania to the batch. Finally, in terms of things that might contaminate the batch, we have oxidation scale from the blowing iron, which could introduce iron oxide. We also need to think about what could maybe be lost during the heating. We assume that the alkali, the flux, which in this case we're going to be talking about soda or sodium, might be driven off due to the high temperatures with repeated recycling cycles. But we could also be losing other volatiles, including chlorine. Archaeologists studying ancient glass recycling have made several assumptions which underlie much of the current ideas about how much glass recycling was going on in the past and what that recycling looks like chemically. First, the glass becomes rapidly unworkable with repeated recycling without the input of fresh glass. This assertion is often cited without reference, but is largely based on anecdotal evidence from modern studio glass workers working with gas and electric fired ovens employing high, stable temperatures. Secondly, that this deterioration in the workability of the glass is the result of two primary factors. Significant loss of flux, sodium, resulting in increased glass viscosity, and contamination coming from wood fuel by potassium, phosphorus, magnesium and calcium. And finally, that the rate of contamination and or loss with repeated recycling is consistent and could be used to quantify rates of recycling in the past. However, the veracity and applicability of these assumptions to ancient glass recycling has never previously been tested. Experimental archaeology provides the only means of directly testing these assumptions. Although several reconstruction furnaces have been built and run over the last decade, the very few experiments designed to understand recycling have been confined to the lab. My work sought to be the first to empirically test the effects of recycling on the chemical composition and working properties of glass using a period-appropriate furnace structure and, most crucially, using wood fuel as a heat source. A baseline glass of known composition was produced against which changes in chemical composition and working properties with increased recycling could be measured. Pure laboratory reagents were used and the batch was melted using an electric laboratory furnace to prevent any contamination entering the glass prior to the first recycling cycle. The furnace replicated the small furnace design by Taylor and Hill and used for the experimental reproduction of Roman glasses from their 2008 paper. This had the advantage of the associated publication containing detailed information about construction methods, resource usage, both in terms of construction and firing, and firing regimes, as well as detailed plans and section drawings to draw from. The furnace was constructed using a daub of heavily grogged stoneware clay and roughly 30% by volume of straw. The firing chamber and siege supports used vermiculite firebricks. The bricks inside the firing chamber were given a sacrificial skin of daub to help protect them from the direct heat of the fire, and the siege was constructed using two high temperature fire tiles. The experiment ran for a total of five days, 24 hours per day, during which the glass was recycled five times. For the purposes of reproducibility, the experiment was run twice, henceforth referred to as experiment A and experiment B. A fresh batch of raw glass and a new crucible were utilised for each repeat to ensure that there was no cross-contamination between the glass from experiment A to experiment B. The wood used was a mixture of hardwood species. The furnace was charged with 500 grams of raw glass on the first day of each experiment. On each following day, the glass was removed from the furnace after being held at between 900 to 1100 degrees C for 12 hours. Temperatures were logged every 15 minutes whilst the glass was inside the furnace. 
The glass was removed from the furnace in one of two ways. On days one, three and five of each week, the glass was worked by a professional glass worker to assess the workability of the glass and any changes in working properties associated with recycling. On days two and four, I removed the glass from the furnace myself by simply gathering the glass on the end of an iron and pulling it into rough canes that could be easily broken up into colour for recycling. On these days, no formal assessment of workability was made. The glass was broken up into chunks, weighed, a small fragment taken for chemical analysis, and the furnace was charged again with the recycled glass. The information provided by workability assessments adds a vital additional dimension to understanding the effects of recycling on glass, not accessible through chemical analysis alone, in a way that would have been significantly more applicable and meaningful to glass workers in antiquity. The combination of workability data with the record of changing chemical composition with increased recycling enables us to make stronger links to craft person experience and decision-making practices when discussing recycling in the past. Workability was assessed using a combination of workability scores and commentary on the experience of working with glass provided by an experienced modern glass worker. Collection of workability data in the field requires specialist expert understanding and experience of glass and glass working. Changes in working properties can be subtle and can be affected by a range of variables and understanding of these factors is vital to ensuring that the information collected is reliable. To this end, I worked with Colin Rennie from the University of Sunderland, a specialist in glass blowing and hot glass working based at the National Glass Centre in the UK. Workability scores were awarded for three criteria, softness, homogeneity and length, and the definitions of these are up on your screen now. Each criterion was scored on a relative scale of 1 to 10, where 10 would be a typical modern studio glass, familiar to the glass worker, with ideal, and it's key to stress this is ideal as judged by a modern studio glass worker, homogeneity, working length and softness. Two tests were used to assess the working property criteria. These were a cane pull test, so this is judged by the ease with and length to which a cane could be pulled using one smooth continuous pulling motion. And a vessel blowing test. Blowing a small vessel modelled on a simple palm cup with an outfolded lip. An effort was made to ensure that the vessels were blown from similarly sized gather each time in order to ensure the comparability between tests. This graph shows the percentage difference from the raw glass for a total of five elements, sodium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium and calcium, across each of the five days of the experiment for experiment B. As might be predicted, there is an increase seen in both phosphorus and potassium over the five days, whilst there is a decrease in sodium. However, it is notable that the percentage difference in sodium between the raw glass and the glass on day five is only negative 6%. In terms of a relative effect on composition, phosphorus is the element most affected by recycling in experiment B. The percentage difference in phosphorus between the baseline and day 5 is plus 75%, with a steady increase across all five days of the experiment. Likewise, there is also a largely consistent increase in potassium observable in experiment B, though the relative increase in the element is smaller than that of phosphorus, amounting to a total increase in potassium of plus 19% by day 5 of the experiment. Both magnesium and calcium recycling, um, for both magnesium and calcium recycling made little difference. A pattern similar to that of experiment B can be observed whereby the elements most clearly affected by recycling in experiment A are phosphorus, potassium and sodium, with an overall decrease in sodium and increases in both phosphorus and potassium. However, the increases in both phosphorus, phosphorus and potassium are in general much smaller than experiment B. In experiment A, a large increase in magnesium can be seen on day 5, plus 43%, correlating with similar significant increases in phosphorus, plus 125%, and potassium, plus 110%, and a decrease in calcium. What is a particularly notable consistency between experiments A and B is that, once again, the concentrations of sodium, whilst demonstrating an overall decrease, show relatively little change from the baseline, including the samples from day 5, which demonstrate significant changes in all other elements. This next set of graphs show, for both experiments A and B, the workability scores that were awarded for the recycled glass. 
The scores and overall trends across the three days are largely very consistent between experiment A and B. Both glass softness and length increase between day one and day three, with then slight decreases again in the scores for both of these properties on day five, whilst homogeneity either increased over time in experiment A or remained consistent from days three to five in experiment B. The low scores on day one are attributable to a high degree of bubbles in the glass as a result of the raw glass having been too finely crushed before being added to the crucible. Adjusting for this, the results would otherwise look similar to those on day three. The agreement between experiment A and B in terms of overall trends suggests that the actual effect of recycling upon workability was largely consistent between the two experiments. This is particularly notable given that experiment B demonstrated generally higher degrees of contamination than experiment A, with the exception of day 5, which might have been expected to result in overall lower scores. This suggests the working properties of the glass are not strongly affected by the input of relatively small amounts of contamination by potassium or phosphorus, and that the relative lack of loss of flux in both experiments is probably key to the consistency and workability. Whilst of course there remains a degree of subjectivity involved, the scoring system was designed to provide a framework for consistency and replicability in the glassworkers' observations, and to allow for semi-quantitative analysis of workability. Let's revisit those assumptions that I said were underpinning much of the way that we currently think about glass recycling in the archaeological past. First, the idea that glass becomes rapidly unworkable with repeated recycling. Well, although recycling does have some effect upon the workability of the glass, the glass remains very workable, even after five cycles of closed loop recycling, and the rate of change after the initial remelting cycle of day one is in fact only very slight. This is contrary to suggestions made of a rapid deterioration of glass quality and workability with increased recycling, largely based upon anecdotal evidence for modern glass workers, using gas and electric fired ovens. Changes in workability with recycling would likely not have been especially notable to individual glass workers who were already used to working with more variable conditions and composition than modern studio glass workers, and any changes that may have occurred would most likely have been gradual over lifetimes or generations. The idea that there is a significant loss of flux during recycling. I think this can also be refuted. These experiments showed that very little sodium was lost, with maximum change in the baseline of only negative 6%. Even when heavy contamination was present, the rate of loss of sodium was consistent. The impact of losing such a small amount of flux on workability appears to be negligible. Contamination by wood fuel was the most obvious impact of recycling upon the glass, even, and although even this was relatively small in terms of actual values. However, most of the contamination came from phosphorus and potassium, and there was actually very little change in the values of magnesium and calcium, contrary to what is usually assumed. Where the impact of magnesium upon the glass composition was seen, it was only when accompanied by extremely high contamination by potassium and phosphorus. It is possible this reflects the difference between contamination by combustion vapours versus direct contamination by ash. And finally, the idea that the rate of contamination or loss is consistent and could have been used to quantify recycling in the past. I think that this idea is problematic. The rate of contamination is variable across experiment A and experiment B, despite them being performed under as close to the exact same conditions as possible. Experiment A also demonstrates the potential for large spikes in contamination, possibly resulting from direct contamination by ash. These results clearly demonstrate that attempts to quantify past recycling using wood fuel contamination would be particularly problematic, given the complications of potential mixed coloured sources and addition of fresh glass. However, general trends towards higher degrees of contamination across a particular object type, site or chronological period could still be taken as indicative of more intensive recycling practices. These findings are made yet more robust when we consider that this a worst case scenario for recycling, where glass is repeatedly recycled within a completely closed loop system with no influx of fresh glass, essentially allowing for the maximum likelihood for contamination by wood fuel and loss of flux. These experiments have demonstrated that some of the key assumptions underlying our interpretation of past glass recycling are likely either simply incorrect or too simplistic. It is very likely that significantly more recycling was going on in the past than might be predicted using our current models. Much recycling is likely to be chemically invisible, particularly in situations where regular influxes of fresh glass were utilised alongside recycled material. Thank you very much.